Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Airlock, and this is a follow-up part to my Wonderland talk I just gave. So please see that last talk, and now I am going to continue on, and this is going to be a talk about how Wonderland, the snark, and other texts line up with the categories and other points of Aristotle. So let's get right back into it. And thank you for your sustained patience and my sustained verbiage. So, The Looking Glass, The Second Adventure of Alice, Mirrors Wonderland, chapter by chapter. This has been long known. There's clear inversions back and forth between the text, and the text is centered on a mirror. So the first chapter of each of Alice's adventures, though, given the theory that I'm into about the categories of Aristotle and how it fits with Wonderland, please see my last video, that the first chapter of each of Alice's adventures, and this fits with the ethics behind all of this, is about passion with the white rabbit and the black kitten. You can see how the white rabbit black kitten are inversions of each other. The Also, the white rabbit is nervous. The black kitten is manically into things opposite the white rabbit's personality. The second chapter is about action with the swimming mouse and the running red queen. Now, notice how a swimming mouse and a running red queen are both, all these ways are mine. They are both acting, that is their character, but they are, a swimming mouse is very afraid, and the running red queen is quite authoritative. The third chapter is about state, with the Dodo's caucus race, which runs around in a circle, and the gnat on the public train, which goes in a line. And there are, is something about the caucus race being the fools in charge, and the public train being everybody, and the public being somewhat stupid themselves, I think. The fourth chapter is about position, with Alice taking a position in the White Rabbit's house, she fills the position then, and between Tweedledum and Dee while she's in the Red King's dream. Now again, the White Rabbit's house is somewhat stately. I do think that's one of the four corners of the square of opposition there with Aristotle, is some and some, uh, positive some, positive particular, is the White Rabbit, some and some of man and beast, and late and late and late. And so there's something aristocratic and landed with the White Rabbit, and Tweedle, Dumb, and Dee are twins out in the woods, and they say, how do you do? So there's a upper kind of lower class thing going reversal back there. But they are hanging out with the Red King, who's in his own dream, somewhat in excluding Alice as the royal figure in that, I, uh, whereas the White Rabbit is including Alice in him. In his, Alice is told she's in the Red King's dream, but the White Rabbit orders her into his house, whereas the Red King is taking a snooze by himself, it seems, to Alice. The fifth and sixth chapters, sixth chapters of each work are about time, space, and relations interwoven and mixed together. Now that sounds more complicated than it actually is, because it simply is that it goes time, relations, and then space gets to appear somewhere amidst there and elsewhere as space. Such that the fifth chapter of each book is about time with the Caterpillar of Wonderland and the White Queen of the Looking Glass. The sixth chapter is about relations with the Duchess and Humpty Dumpty, who are both poor in relations. Again, you kind of have the Duchess is ruling, Humpty Dumpty thinks he's high up and he will get royal assistance, but he is quite the fool and not one of the four royal characters, I don't think. And Space, the Cheshire Cat and the White Sheep, does not have its own chapter, its own space is space itself. Rather, and this is the tricky but interesting part that simply makes all this work, Space, I really do think Space and Time have pivotal, pivotal roles as the, as the Caterpillar and Cheshire Cat in the categories of Aristotle in Wonderland. And I also think that the White queen is both herself time and space because she is time as the herself and then she is space and the shop and place always out of reach as the sheep and you can see that when she is the white queen form in the same chapter she is oriented all about time and then she herself morphs into the sheep knitting with 14 pairs of knitting needles that would be 10 categories plus four forms of opposition equals 14. And she's knitting them like this because this whole tale 
and the previous is very much knitted together out of Aristotle's 10 categories. I gave the list in the last, which is counting up and going upward all of this. And then also the four corners of the square of, uh, of opposition, the four forms of proposition, which is also the four forms of syllogism for the one perfect form of four syllogisms, actually. The ones you learn for logic. All the rest of Aristotle are only somewhat, and people tend to discard them and ignore them, actually. This is a lot about what people tend to discard and ignore of Aristotle as opposed to preserve. Carroll is clearly playing with parts of Aristotle people have already discarded, which were primary. And Carroll may know that he's hiding things, in, in, like Poe, in plain sight, in ways that are quite interesting and amusing. Because again, it's not much of a reach to talk about the ten categories of Aristotle and the four forms of proposition. That is the Aristotle one might be primarily interested in in the first and second books of the Organon, Aristotle's work about logic. So this is the complicated part of the theory, but actually, if you understand that in Wonderland, the caterpillar is time, just as the white queen is time, and they have corresponding chapters, but then space is with the Duchess with relations in Wonderland, and space is actually the White Queen herself morphing into the sheep in the second. I do think that the second tale, this looking glass, simplifies things because it makes the four corners of the square of opposition the four royal red and white queens, which is easier to see four of. There are four of them. Which is why Humpty Dumpty can be very much counted out, because there's four royal pieces such that it's not a white rabbit or not, it's the four royalty. And then you also have, in this, it might be tricky because space and relations, I admit, interwoven is confusing in the middle. So in the second book, you have the white queen turns into the sheep, and you have time and space essentially sharing the same space and same chapter and same character in two forms. I think that that does simplify things in the second book, because Carol would have known, if I am right at all about any of this, no one found it at all, so he made it a little bit even simpler, I think, in the second book, and then followed with non-fictional work about logic, first as a game, and then going even more towards Bool, somewhat reluctantly as it was catching on in his later decades of life, and going into symbolic logic. And logic became more formal in Lewis Carroll's later years. At this time, in his own years, it had not been. So yes, I don't think uh, Lewis Carroll knew who Frege was. But all that is interrelated. And here we are, leaving relations behind us. So... This is the most confusing part of the theory, but it is the part where the categories themselves are most interwoven, like my cat's getting intertangled in the background, in time and space amidst everything. Again, cat is place, and they rule this. The seventh chapter of each work is about quality, with the underqualified rude mad tea party and the overperforming lion and unicorn, and with the hatter and hare of poor character and quality in both, but opposite because they're underacting and underperforming in the first, and overperforming and overacting with Anglo-Saxon odd attitudes, which is exactly what that seems to be, in both. The eighth chapter, I mean, it's exactly overacting, is what it seems to be described as. The eighth chapter is about quantity of each, with the playing cards of the Queen of Hearts and the endless inventions of the White Knight, an innumerable quantity as opposed to the cards. The remaining chapters of each work are about substance, or its absence, with the insubstantial lies of the Mock Turtle leading to the King of Hearts trial over the stolen but recovered tarts, and in this, the Queen's testing Alice in unnumbered sums. It is tempting to put quantity with the Queen's testing Alice of sums, especially because the Queen of Hearts, I claim, is quantity in the last one. But I do think it is the White Knight, which is the corresponding numerical chapter to the Queen of Hearts, who is quantity in the last one. He has a bountiful sum of things. He has a bountiful sum of an, an endless, unquant, unnumerated quantity of muchness of invention, which is a different kind of quantity. And if the Queen of Hearts is off with the head none, he is a bunch in corresponding opposition. And he's a kindly, nice character, somewhat royal, to the Queen of Hearts, opposite character. Towards Alice, anyway, off with her head versus sing you a nice song, at least, with several be, uh, names somewhat, uh, well, the head of each and the title somewhat removed, but the uh, remaining chapters of each work are about substance and absence, and the Queen's testing Alice in unnumbered sums is not quantity because they are testing her in, if you slice bread with a knife, you get slices, not 
specifically some number. Just, I mean, you would in a situation, but the answer to that is you get slices of bread, not four. That's not the answer to what happens when you slice bread with a knife. You get four, no. You get slices, and we don't know how many. That's the answer to that in reasoning, right? So you would also get, well, if you take the bone away from the dog, you have the passion and the temper left over. Keep your temper and temperance over time and passion over time. I do claim in these stories. Just as my cat has passion for things on the ceiling over time and only slowly gets to them. And not everything, if I slowly move it, again, it's all quite terrestrial. But, in the end anyway. So, with all of that, the Queen's testing Alice in unnumbered sums leading to the banquet is absence, sort of abstraction of substances, sums, and then substance at the banquet in which they turn into the food, and the food turns into them, which is living and, I suppose, soon-to-be living substances, somewhat. So, let's walk through the Looking Glass. In the opening chapter of Looking Glass, the black kitten attacks the yarn with passion, Alice threatens and kisses her passionately, and we learn she threatened her nurse as if she was a hyena. I love that part. Alice fears the world in the mirror, trying to tri maybe trying to trick her with false fire and smoke. Like those pretending to have some sort of false passion or fire, but lie and have other motives, which does happen soon in the story. The White Queen rushes to her screaming baby, so passionate she knocks over the king. Alice laughs at the king's frozen horror and moves the pen of the king as if she is the passion or genius that directs him. And we hear of the dreaded Jabberwock, this sort of unknown horror. Which is part of the brilliance of the Jabberwock, and it is all mirrored backwards, which I think reflects what Carol had done in the last story of Wonderland, which is hide the, the categories and the text of the categories and its list backwards. In the next chapter, Alice finds a backwards-acting corkscrew path, and action is much like the shape of a corkscrew, circling while pushing forward. It's a circle if you look through the center of it, and it's linear if you look across its length. A corkscrew is used forwards and backwards, otherwise it's stuck. You have to do both. A cork, the corkscrew path keeps turning Alice back, but she pushes on to flowers that can't move or act as Alice can. They are stuck. So they criticize her for being different. They're rooted in the ground and can't move. That is a bunch of the humor there. Unlike birds and beasts, Alice doesn't lead them. She doesn't lead them all to swim to shore, like in the corresponding Wonderland chapter, but she just goes past them and leaves them. Even the tiger lily, who sides with her, can't get at the posies. And they know that, which is why they talk. And we hear this. They say the tree will act for them if there is danger barking, but trees don't bark. And so it wouldn't act. It can't, just as they can't. So they're wrong about that. At least, you know, perhaps not. But there seems a lot that uh, the tree will not act as they claim it will. The Red Queen contradicts and corrects Alice continuously in her actions, criticizing everything Alice does. So we have inaction in the flowers leading to stopping Alice from doing anything with the Queen of None. All these ways are mine, none yours, is what that logically converts to. It does convoit. And Alice sees they are all playing chess, which shows her her future course of action out before her. So she's corrected in action and limited in action, and then she's shown by this queen limiting all of her actions, the span and the absence, the whole span, queens can move the whole length of the board, which is why both of the queens seem to be top corners of the square of opposition, all or none. The queens are significant, of course, throughout this story as dueling red and white. It really is the shape of the queens and the kings here that does solidly, I think, show the square of opposition here very much more so clearly in the second, but it is in the first, as I've already said. So the moment the queen tells Alice she will be a queen herself if she acts across the board when she reaches the end, they both begin running hand in hand, as if acting completely. They run as fast as they can to stay in place with biscuits that make matters worse, action leading to passion, not satisfaction in a settled state. Much like the unsatisfied, uh, upset, insulting flowers. In the next chapter, the state is reflected by the train which moves in a line rather than in a circle like the caucus race, although both are quite useless and foolish. The passengers talk together with slogans like the public mind. An insect who tells jokes Alice ignores shows her the rich dragonfly who is made of plum pudding and brandy and the poor bread and butterfly who always fails to find enough and to eat and dies. Names are like titles, like the state. We're talking about the rich and the poor dying, and that is what they live on or don't. Their names. They literally live on what their names are or don't. 
As the gnat sighs himself away, Alice goes from sad puns, double-meaning words, to blissfully losing her name in the woods with a fawn and both forgetting their position, which the Tweedle twins now show us and take us in the next chapter into position. Because she just lost hers entirely, and they're going to try to keep her in a poor one. In the next chapter, Alice meets the Tweedles, who offer her opposed positions in logic, contrary-wise, and tell her the longest story of the walrus and carpenter misleading and eating young oysters to keep her out in the woods with them. In On Interpretation, Aristotle says, If such things may be or may not be, events may take place or may not. This is much like saying if it was so, it might be, and if it were so, it would be, but as it isn't, it ain't, and that's logic. Alice calls them first boy and next boy, as prime school boy and secondary school boy, oh, uh, the first most in the class and the second most in the class used to be put in the first and second most seat, which is not currently practiced anymore, or advised, I believe, by many. But Dumb says she should begin by shaking hands as if equals. He says, nah, and we're all equals, how do you do, which is lower class, not in, in position, high position like she claims they are. The brothers hug each other as equals, and Alice finds herself dancing around and around foolishly with them all holding hands, with music coming from under a tree, in fact. Which seems a bit of the cat, actually, but that is a bit out of place with the chapters, of course. Um, as the walrus and carpenter opens, the sun is in the moon's position, the middle of the night. The walrus is upper class, and the carpenter is lower class, with, paper, with a paper workman's hat, as someone pointed out. The oysters do not listen to their elder in senior position and wiser. They stop at a rock conveniently low in position so the oysters can join them and then get reached and eaten. The walrus begins with talk of lowly things, but also then highly kings, low and high position. The oysters ask not to be eaten, and the walrus asks if they admire the view, distraction with position. The Alice hears the Red King snoring, and they tell her that she, she is only a thing in his dream, which is equally and oppositely the case, as he is a thing in her dream, consuming her like bats eat cats, like walrus eat oysters, and she is dreaming of him, each eclipsing the position of the other equally round and round. Dumb puts a saucepan on his head. It's now a helmet by position. Alice asks if it is going to rain. Dumb spreads a large umbrella and says it will not rain under it, and they don't care if it rains outside the umbrella, outside that position, mirroring the helmet. The umbrella is as sharp as a sword. Alice laughs, but it is at the tip, in that small position, like under the umbrella, and they don't care otherwise. One angry and red with fury. It's an instance of red and white. The other timid and white with fright, and the red and white queens frame Alice in the end. They agree to have a battle over a broken rattle, which, like a corkscrew, works by moving backwards and forwards. The ra battle is interrupted, not resolved by the black crow, which sends both brothers equally fleeing in fright. In the prior analytics, Aristotle says if A stands for crows and B for intelligent, then no A applies to B and vice versa, as no crows are intelligent and no intelligent things are crows, which I don't support as a view, but that would make the black crow very much a uh, ignorance. As well as it seems, uh, I do compare this to Poe's Raven and wonder if Carol was somewhat inspired by the author he admired, because the ignorance of the darkness is really not where Lenore is, but that she just is no more and nowhere, in a sense, and that darkness seems to be a bit of the horror of Poe. In the next chapter, the White Queen remembers whatever happens both ways in time, acts like a child, says her shawl is out of temper, and doesn't see a problem with jam days other than today. The Latin pun on iam is about now in the future and past tenses, some claim, and I believe them, which would make sense with time and tenses. Alice tells her she is seven and a half exactly, and the Queen tells Alice she is 101 years, five months and a day old, which Alice says she cannot believe, and the White Queen tells Alice to take a breath, shut her eyes, and try again. But this is silly, as taking more time and effort is to believe won't help. Notice this is the corresponding chapter to The Caterpillar. Notice how much this is about time. It really is time and space that sells this. If the time and the space make sense to you, that really is, I think, what will overall sell the whole case between the passion and the beginning with the, with the animals and then the substances at the end, I think. Alice says she can't believe in impossible things, and the Queen says she simply needs practice, as she sometimes believed six impossible things before breakfast. She tells Alice to consider how she's grown over her life, how long she's come this day, and what time is right now to distract and what time it is right now to distract herself. Notice they're all temporally related. As nobody can do two things at the same time, she tells Alice. 
It's almost like she's asking Alice to not be patient, opposite, of course. She is somewhat childlike and white in her character, which is timid for Aristotle, and weak. So she is very childlike, so she's actually telling Alice to distract herself, which may or may not be good advice, but the caterpillar actually told her the, the, other, the opposite, to keep her patience and temper, which actually did her well then. I don't know if distracting herself is doing Alice so much good now, as well as the caterpillar of the last chapter. Perhaps that's another reversal or inversion of Carol between the two books. So, then, and now we have the White Queen in the same chapter turns into space, which is essential for untangling the theory. And again, I do believe it is clearer and uh, more carefully done and with a tangled sheep knitting right here where it should be. She runs ahead of Alice into the next space, we're told, even though it doesn't change chapters. We have some of those demarking little things, little asterisks or what have you in the pattern. And as Alice joins her, the White Queen turns into the sheep and the themes of time turn into space. Please read it for yourself if you don't believe me, but you can see. Knitting something out of herself, the place she is, and then arranging something of herself spatially, and says Alice can look this way or that, but can't look all around herself at once. Suddenly she sounds like the Cheshire Cat, which in Wonderland is sharing actually the next chapter with the Duchess, which puts space actually numerically one or the other. That part of space, which numerical chapter space is in, does not actually in my theory line up. I think that actually is a bit of an, in, uh, not an inconsistency with the overall theory, but I think Carol did it one way and then clarified it this way in which time, time turns into space in the same chapter. That would be like the caterpillar turning into the Cheshire cat in the original book, which is not the way he clearly arranged it. And again, the fact that the Cheshire cat talks after the Duchess, I think further confuses it. And this is far less confusing of the same pattern. That's my claim. I think it makes sense. But let's get back to the place in the space. So, the uh, this is much more like what Alice learned from the Cheshire Cat. You can't look all around yourself at once. Alice says she doesn't know what she wants, and so will look all around the shop, searching the space. In the sheep's shop, things flow about spatially so, such that when Alice tries to grasp a bright thing that looks sometimes like a doll... And sometimes like an old work box, which would be a toy with serious compartments and categories. If what I'm claiming is true, these stories have serious categories in them. Like a doll with a work box as w uh, that's a work box as well. So it keeps sliding away out of its place. And then the space of the shop turns into an outdoor river. Indoor turns into outdoor. Space of one kind turns into opposite space altogether, flowing about so, such that then she's outside instead of inside the shop, and the grass and the thrushes, uh, the rushes are always greener. Idealizing where we are not, whatever is where we can't reach. Notice how inside the shop turns into outside with the plants, the water plants. And notice here that space is flowing about so crazy, and it was time, and now space is space is a different space. And what is in space is not reachable. So the shop turns into a river, and back into a shop with the space changing locations. The sheep is knitting with 14 pairs of knitting needles all at once, which ama amazes Alice, and I do suggest, if I am right about the 10 categories and the four forms of proposition... Those would be two ideas, the two primary ideas, the primary idea of the first book of Aristotle's Logic, the categories, and the primary idea of the second book on interpretation. The two ideas you could teach a child with examples illustrated, and they might not even know it. That it does seem like the ten categories and the four forms of proposition is the 14 pairs of knitting needles, and here's Lewis Carroll as the sheep. That's my impression of him. So... The White Queen says she can't put things in people's hands herself as the sheep. As place, that would mean I don't put things in people's hands myself. Well, if she's place itself, she doesn't place anything in people's hands because she's place itself. And space itself doesn't do, in a certain sense, anything in a certain sort of punny way. It doesn't hand anything to you. It's the space in which you are handed things, yes? So the egg that she wants, which will turn into Humpty Dumpty, 
like place itself, which is in its own position in space and thus, according to the cat, very much uh, bad at relations like the Duchess next, recedes as she walks towards it thus, spatially, as Humpty will into his own position thus bad relations. They do not leave the shop of, the, of place and don't leave place, but rather the shop as before turns into the, out, <clears throat> turns into the outside again. In the next chapter, Humpty Dumpty, like the Duchess, is essentially terrible at relations. Now, I will happy, be happy to admit there are several of these chapters that could be poor relations, right? There are several of these chapters that have to do with time, right? Yes. But I think that is, of course, the cheap, easy answer is, Aristotle and Carroll will tell you, all the categories are interwoven, like what the sheep was just doing here. It does get hazy. I think he is showing it interweaves and blends at the edges. We've already been covering much of that in different ways. But even as the edges get blurry, especially in this text where it starts to lead one category into the other, and you can see it in the last and first words of, the, of chapters, it still is quite consistent chapter by chapter, enough with each theme that I do think that the way that I am schematizing it does succeed, but it is a arguable possibility, more so than somebody would mix up the categories and apply them differently, but again... I am interested in hearing it. I think it applies enough to the reversed inverted list that it makes sense to be consistent here. But again, that is as best I have it now. So Humpty Dumpty, like the Duchess, is terrible at relations. He is even unaware he's an egg. He perches dangerously, expecting all the king's men to save him if he fails, treats conversation like a competitive game, and thinks words mean only what he says they mean. He orders fish to do as he wishes, doesn't listen to them, and moves to kill them with a corkscrew in hand, acting in an ambiguous way, because if corkscrew corresponds to action, as I claim, he has action in his hand, and then it ends ambiguously, doesn't it? We don't know what happens, and so it is just action in his hand. He leaves his action hanging, like him without further development, because like the Mad Tea Party, um, and like the Duchess, in fact, like many of these people... He is not tempered over time like Alice, which is consistent throughout both tales, and thus patient and not rude with others, yes? He suddenly says goodbye, presuming to end the conversation whenever he likes. Alice tries to be cheerful and saying goodbye until they meet again, and he gives her only one finger to shake. I've heard this is an uh, upper-class folks gave people occasionally two fingers to shake, I've heard. But he very impolitely, impolitely gives her one finger to shake and says he would not recognize her as she exact, is exactly so much like other people. It's a very rude thing to tell people, and very ignorant of him. He shuts his eyes and says no more. As Alice leaves, she says to herself, of all the unsatisfactory people I've ever met, similar to the words she says at the end of the tea party, but this time it is just before the chapter with Heron Hatter. Now, at first I was a little concerned, oh, well, that was actually what she said about poor quality of the hair and the Hatter, but guess who's coming right now? So you can actually see with a little bit he's talking about poor quality right as what happens here, the chapter with the hair and the hatter and the chapter that's about quality, because it's all about overacting instead of underacting and being outside of time and underdeveloping. It's actually about being old powers that be instead of young, uh, well, rude, undeveloped people going, well, they're going round and round and fighting, though. So in the next chapter, the White King sends his horses and men an act of noble and caring quality. He praises Alice's eyes when she sees she sees when she says she sees nobody on the road. Unlike the Tea Party, his messengers Haga and Hatta overextend themselves for others and overact with Anglo-Saxon attitudes. Unlike Wonderland, where the hare offered wine and had none, the king asks for a ham sandwich and has it immediately. So it's quite opposite. The king eats hay, saying there's nothing like it, not that it's good of good quality. Hatta overeats, and the lion and unicorn overfight, knocking each other over 87 times each. That's way too much. They see the White Queen running by, and the king says you can't stop her. Well, if the White Queen is time, you can't stop time, and all the battle's running, as she's running while the battle keeps going. The unicorn and Alice agree to believe in each other, and they all share plum pudding. It's very good quality and of good character, sir of the unicorn and Alice to agree to believe in each other, even in spite of the fact that both are fabulous monsters. It's another place where Alice is referred to as a beast, a passionate beast, and a monster. And they all share plum pudding, which overacts in dividing itself up for others, which is incredible. Clear in the throat. In the next chapter, 
The white knight produces an endless quantity of useless ideas, wears an upside-down box on his back such that everything falls out like a jar without marmalade or an ideal category or quantity like the playing cards. He has a hive with no bees and a mousetrap with problems with mice, and he constantly falls off his horse. His cleverest idea is a pudding that has never been cooked. Also think of the chess moves in this chapter and how that would work with quantity and logic. Because here... Carol is a mathematician and does logic as a mathematician, so quantity, the chapters of quantity, are a bit bound up uh, on the edges as well as in the chapters with logic and moves of logic, moralizing, etc. So his cleverest idea is a pudding that has never been cooked, so the proof isn't in the pudding, and it's an abstract idea of his that doesn't have substance because he is still quantity. While the Queen's test Allison sums in the following chapter, neither they nor the White Knight use numerical quantities, but rather overabundance in substances, and then they do sums in substances. So in the next chapter, Alice finds a golden crown on her head as balance of gold between the Red and White Queens, who I think are all or none, very much the top. She is now at the top of the square of opposition at the top of the, at the end of the square of the chessboard. And the queens, and keep in mind, Carol made the game of logic after this nonfiction work to teach Aristotelian, not exactly like this, but Aristotelian forms of what I am describing, uh, or will more so, um, after these works. So the queens introduce Alice to an, uh, she finds herself doing those sums, which is dividing a, uh, dividing bread with a knife and taking a bone from a dog. They do introduce Alice to an actual pudding at the banquet, but they first test her about sums that begin with strange not with quantities, but with substances. Again, you actually get slices from a, from bread, not a specific quantity unless that's what you're going for. If you're just dividing bread with a knife, the answer would not be a quantity. It would be slices of bread. Um, taking bone from, uh, bone from a dog, it leaves a strange remainder of temper, which again would be an absence of temperance, which keeps the time and balance themes going strong. So the banquet and dream end with the guests and food trading places, and Alice shakes the dream queen into the real kitten. And that said, I will break this talk off here. As usual, actually, my voice is starting to go a tiny little bit. But that would leave a about 30-minute talk on each of the ways I believe Aristotle's categories, running from lowest to highest in the reverse order that he lists them, including centrally time and space as the caterpillar and the cat and the white queen turning into the sheep, very much demonstrate that Aristotle's categories line up with both books such that you can remember the books. It's like the cats eating the bats and bats and back and forth. You can actually use Aristotle's categories, and I do now, to remember the order of events of Wonderland and the Looking Glass, and you can use the order of events of Wonderland and Look Wonderland, Wondergland is what I just said. Wow. Wondergland and looking lass. Yes, I'm going to retire as of now. So, essentially, both books could be mnemonic devices, if I can even speak, for children who are apparently just learning to talk and learn logic, which, of course, for Aristotle is verbal reasoning and debate, which for Carol is somewhat bound up with proto-psychological emotional logical states, which he is trying to represent in games, which makes him very much like earlier Poe and later Wittgenstein. So, that being said, I am going to follow with a video about the hunting of the snark. My voice is starting to go a little bit, uh, so I may save that for, uh, well, for tomorrow morning or when I can. I have many more lectures on logic. Please see my playlist about Aristotle through Alice. Please see my longer playlist about logic in which I talk out Indian and Chinese logic as well, which is quite valuable, as well as give a couple introductory, some all too long talks about what I think the relationship between emotion and logic is that Poe, Carroll, and Wittgenstein are pointing out to us. And then I am, uh, please see my videos about Poe's detective stories, my videos about Alice in Wonderland and logic. And I will follow in the month of May with many a video about Wittgenstein in which I explain one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of modern thinkers and what his thinking means for us in terms of understanding how objects, memories, emotions, and ever so certainly or uncertainly words weave together situationally to create what we call meaning, a.k.a. thought, for the common person to understand how their mind works better. 
which of course is the point of doing any of this. So, much love, much happiness, and I will follow with how I think the hunting of the snark is a mixed up logic problem that mixes up the ten, doesn't keep them in order, mixes up the ten, and then there's ten who hunt the snark each who stand for a logical category of Aristotle. Once again, I am going to be that boring, I insist. Much love, much happiness, and I will, as always, see you, if I ever do, manage to see you.